Good afternoon and uh, welcome to my keynote talk, in fact my closing keynote talk at the 2022 International Symposium on New Trends in Computational Intelligence. Uh, my name is Torsten Hafra, I'm a professor at ETH Zurich and I'm going to talk about efficient artificial intelligence ranging from supercomputers to smartphones. So the first question may be why do we worry about efficiency? Well, I'm assuming many of you know <laughs> why you worry about efficiency, but I want to give it a little bit more of a motivation, going back to the uh, 2018 uh, Turing Award lecture given by Geoffrey Hinton and Jan Le Kun um, together. And I want to specifically um, take one thing uh, that Geoffrey Hinton says, or actually two, two quotes from him, that really the deciding factor for the artificial intelligence revolution today was the increase in compute power. So bigger efficiency, bigger affordability, bigger models. And furthermore, he said that I think a lot of credit for deep learning goes to others, people who create the data, but that's not part of this talk, and the people who made computers go fast. So that is the real question. How do we make computers go fast? How do we make them efficient and scale to larger models? Well, how do we do this? Well, we could actually ask the 2021 Turing Award winner, Jack Dongera, how to make computers fast, because this is what he spent uh, most of his career on, and helping the HPC community to scale to extremely large ma machines, massively parallel machines, that achieve more than 70% efficiency for dense linear algebra. And that is also part of my field. I'm working in the very large scale uh, supercomputing field. Jack is a very good friend. And we are driving this forward also in the area of deep learning, which is now dominating as you know, at least news and, uh, and also big investments, where people start building supercomputers. Like for the first time, supercomputers are um, built big scale in industry to learn new artificial intelligence models. Here, Meta creates uh, AI supercomputer. Tesla, a car company, talks about AI supercomputers. They even built their own chip. Google builds an AI supercomputer. Microsoft invests a billion dollars into providing computer resources to OpenAI. And they even have a, a nice comic about this on a supercomputer that runs 10,000 GPUs. So what does it mean? Why do we build these very large scale supercomputers? What do we want to do? Well, we want to actually achieve human general intelligence in some sense. And much of the human corpus of knowledge is represented by text in the internet. And many models we train today, like generative models, like GPT-3 and soon coming GPT-4 models, or also the chat GPT model that was re just released last week, are models that learn statistical distributions of text on the internet, like this text over there. You can read it yourself. But then they run it through a so-called transformer model, which is what much of the talk focuses on, but even though the talk is, is quite generic, I mean, all the techniques I'm talking about are applicable to pretty much anything, run it through the model to get a prediction of the missing word. So as you see on the left side, it has one word missing. And then you, the, the model creates a prediction, and then we, of course, know which word we removed. And then we train the model backwards to, iteratively, to increase the prediction quality. So the probability that the real missing word, like not in this case, but not sometimes, <laughs> is actually filled in by the model. So and this is done iteratively. And this is done on extremely large data sets. Essentially, we are feeding the whole internet today, or that's what we want to do, through an artificial intelligence model to learn every single word that people have said or spoken. I'm quite sure that this talk that I'm giving is at some point running through one of those models and the model will learn from what I'm saying now like you're learning from what I'm saying now. Furthermore, these models themselves, of course, they represent the knowledge of all of humanity. They want to achieve human or even superhuman performance. They're quite large. So GPT-3 is 700 gigabytes. Gigabytes if you store it in FP32, extremely large models. Um, furthermore, training these large models takes a long time. GPT-3, people said it was, um, could be up to $10 million uh, compute time or uh, compute resources invested, but definitely it takes weeks to train. So this is what we are here to, to understand. And I want to teach you, or I want to talk about uh, three system dimensions in large-scale super learning, and then if there's some time at the end of the talk, I will talk a little bit about sparsity, how to scale down to smaller machines where we get to the cell phones. Because at the end, we want to run these models in our cell phone, which is very challenging, of course, with these extremely large models. So here we have a transformer model, um, iconified by the bird figure on the top right. So 
transformer model um, essentially has various pieces to be processed. Uh, one piece is the uh, high performance IO. So you need to read your input data, of course. Um, and we have quickly growing data volumes, so it gets larger and larger. Another piece, we need to compute the model itself. Right? The model is large, so we need to process all of these uh, neurons and weights and um, whatever the model contains here. You can see it up there, multi-head attention, atom norm, feed-forward layers. We need to process it on some computing device. And the third pillar that I want to get into is when we distribute the uh, model to a very large-scale machine, which is, of course, necessary to train it. Like I mentioned, 10,000 GPUs. We have to care about communication on those machines and synchronization and all these different forms of model parallelism. So I want to go along these three different axes of very large scale super learning in this talk. So let me start, let me talk with the, uh, start with the first one, high performance IO for deep learning. So for example, ResNet 50 has 3.8 gigaflop inference and we will need three times that for training because we need to uh, compute the gradients on the backward pass. So now if we go through ImageNet, um, if you train ResNet 50 with ImageNet, we get 1.3 million images and the average size is about 115 kilobyte. And the range is, is, is pretty massive. So if we now look at the performance on a single A100 that does 2.9 thousand samples per training iteration or per inference iteration, um, then we will get 333 megabyte per second random access throughput because we sample randomly. We would basically need two SSDs in order to load the data for a single A100 GPU, if you look at this. And then for scientific problems, we need even more. So now if you train on thousands of GPUs, I mentioned 10,000 GPUs, we would need 20,000 SSDs to just load the data to feed the training beast to work forward for this particular case. Um, transformers, uh, language transformers are generally cheaper, I have to mention. So there are, there are many, many input file systems, many, many distributed file systems in the high performance computing space that we could use to satisfy that need. But they're quite expensive and uh, quite complex. But the question is now, do we even need this? Because deep learning workloads, when we say they randomly sample, by random we actually mean a pseudo-random sequence with fixed seeds, so we can predict the future. The moment you know the fixed seed, you can predict the future until the end of the training run. And this is what we are using to enable clairvoyant, so predicting the future, prefetching. And we call this the system that we built, the near optimal prefetching system, AKA no PFS, no pun intended. Um, now, how does it work? It's relatively simple. No PFS acts as a distributed cache and uh, each node basically keeps its local cache, but there can also be different cache levels that we could add because the node knows about the future. So now we could look at the access frequency of every single sample, as you know, in deep learning, when we sample mini batches randomly, we will actually sample the same image or the same input sample multiple times. And now each of those uh, samples has now a different access frequency ranging from one to up to 12, actually from zero. Some samples are accessed 18 times. Now we could look at this distribution and say, well, the samples that are accessed very often, so the long tail here, like the 18 times one, we want to cache in local storage because we see them over and over again. Um, great. So now we know this because we have our seed. We can just compute all of this. We can solve this optimally pretty much. And then we can compute our staging buffers to just fill in the data. Here, I'm just giving you a rough overview about lots of different works. And I, uh, I, I ask you to look at the archive link, which is always in the top of the slide, top right, if you want to know more details about this. So now the distributed cache, how does it perform in practice? Well, we ran it on the supercomputer, the Pitt Stein machine. And we can see here that for different numbers of GPUs on the x-axis, 32 up to 256, and um, we are measuring the time to load a batch and actually process a batch. So on the left side, there is PyTorch in blue, then there is PyTorch plus daily an optimized data loader from NVIDIA in green, and then there's our no PFS in yellow. You can already see that the distribution of PyTorch in both cases, even daily optimized, is quite unfavorable as we are having times that are maximum up to 55 seconds to load a batch on that particular system. And with no PFS, we have a very narrow distribution. We have some outliers, of course, because it's a file system. This variance is more than 100x that we are reducing with no PFS. So that, of course, makes training much faster. Then we have the Lassen system, which is another supercomputer um, in, in the United States. So where we run a very similar experiment, and here the, uh, the variation, because we run a much larger number of GPUs, 1024, we reduce the variation by more than 150 times. So really the no PFS system is much 
uh, much faster. You can also look at the total training times, like the runtime per epoch, and it gets significantly faster. Okay, so now I want to get to the next part, high performance compute. How do we compute fast? Now we loaded the data fast, but in order to run our model, train our model, we need to also compute. And here, our thesis is that data movement is the key. So we need to really look at data movement. Again, you can read all the details in the archive paper at the top right. So now if you look at the de computational details of the BERT model or any other transformer model, we can um, already realize that it's quite expensive, as I mentioned before. So people suspect that it could have been up to $12 million to train. And now if you look at the details of uh, the time spent in the model, first of all, the number of floating point operations relatively seen to the overall computation and the runtime run relatively seen to the overall computation. You can see that tensor contractions like matrix multiplications and those operations, they have 99.8% of the flops, but only 61% of the runtime. Huh. Other operations that are data movement bound, tensor contractions are usually compute bound, uh, like statistical normalization and element, element wise operations, they take nearly no floating point operations, but nearly 40% of the time, because tensor contractions are highly optimized. And so 0.2% of the floating point computations take 39% of the time. So that is something we want to fix, because tensor contractions we won't make much faster. This is done. But now the overall computation we could speed up compared to PyTorch by 30%, but even deep speed and manually optimized implementation by 8%. So, and this would save up to $3.6 million if the numbers over there um, um, are right for training um, yeah, on AWS over PyTorch. So how do we do this? Well, this is more complex. I just want to give you a, a rough overview. We look at the computational structure of the BERT model, as you can see on the left side, annotated with all kinds of data movement uh, clauses and computation clauses. Then we use our own uh, data-centric parallel programming framework to analyze how it performs on different data layouts. So we, we recompile the code, we automatically generate different data layouts um, where we permute the dimensions of the layout of each of those tensors. Furthermore, we look at different fusion strategies because as you can see, the data layout already changes a whole lot. So we, we're just looking at, at the distribution of different data layouts here. And there is a factor of nearly 10x that we are seeing between the slowest and the fastest data layout. Of course, we want the fastest data layout. Then we can fuse these many operators that you're seeing in multi-head attention on the left in different ways. So we look through all different fusion strategies. Then we build an overall configuration selection graph where we look at all of these possibilities that we now have, like it's an exponential space, of course, um, and find the shortest path in brackets, the fastest path, the fastest processing path. We optimize the data layout as well as the fusion strategies in this setup. And then we achieve uh, this record-breaking, in some sense, result, which also was an outstanding paper at the MLSYS conference in 2021. Um, where we now achieve the fastest uh, BERT implementation for both forward and backward um, uh, that, that we have seen so far. Okay, so that was high performance compute. So how do we really get uh, the computation done? Now I talked about reading the data, computing the data on a single GPU, but now let me go into the communication of the data because now we are going to scale, of course, to tens of thousands of GPUs. We want to run a very large model, like the GPT-3 model, on a real supercomputer. And so how do we do this? Well, we have um, three dimensions of parallelism in deep learning that I wanted to introduce to you. By the way, if you're interested in parallel deep learning, we, we wrote a relatively um, comprehensive survey in, in 2018, which is still uh, up to date. I mean, you would need to add mixture of experts to it, but that you can just read. Um, that explains all of this. And again, the archive link is in the title up there. But let me explain it at the, at the relatively high level that I can do in this keynote. Um, so we have a set of mini batches. We have mini batch one, mini batch two, mini batch three, and this, in this particular example, mini batch four. Um, so the mini batches are textual data in this case. So lots of text, as you can see. Um, so then the first form of parallelism that you could use is so-called data parallelism, where you take different parts, let's say these three different pages of text from the first mini batch, and you run it through three different copies, full copies of the model. So here we have three different model copies in green, in blue, and in yellow. So now 
of course, it may be that your model is too large to fit. As I mentioned, the, just the weights of the GPT-3 model are 700 gigabytes. So no accelerator today can fit a 700 gigabyte model, at least none I know of. Um, maybe a Cerebras machine could. But then what you could do is you could distribute the different layers to different accelerators, like GPUs. For example, you could take the first layer, the yellow uh, shaded here, on a different GPU than the second layer, the, um, the red shaded here, which is then on a different GPU, again, than the last layers and also the loss function, for example, in the blue shaded layer. That is called pipeline parallelism. So it goes from left to right. We employ three different accelerators. So in this case, if you combine these two different forms of parallelism, you would already use nine accelerators, three in the pipeline parallel dimension, three in the data parallel dimension. Now, if you want to use more accelerators to get speed up, for example, like your training is too slow, you could even cut each of those operators into different pieces. So for example, the top left operator, we could cut in the green, the uh, blue, and the yellow piece. Again, we could have these pieces processed on each accelerator separately. So what this now means this picture shows you how to run this model on 27 different accelerators because we have three by three by three, 27 um, different accelerators. And that is usually how large scale deep learning systems are being trained. So the GPT-3 system has been trained with all three forms of parallelism, data parallelism to distribute across the data, full model copies, pipeline parallelism to distribute the very large model across different accelerators and operator parallelism to speed up each of those layers in the model. So in the transformer case, that would be an encoder layer or just a matrix multiplication to speed it up by distributing it to multiple accelerators. So there, uh, this is just a rough overview uh, that I wanted to give you quickly. There are more talks that I'm giving on, on YouTube in case you're interested or you could also uh, look through my Twitter um, that, um, that I will be posting regularly these, uh, these updates. Um, so now let me go back to just talking about data parallelism, okay? So data parallelism is, is really the easiest form of parallelism. But the interesting thing is what we can do that in data parallelism, or to, to just go back to that slide briefly, what we do is we run these, this mini batch, parts of these mini batches through three different accelerators in that example. What we need to do every now and then is we need to update the weights to just fit uh, to, sorry, to, to synchronize the weights to go with the same gradient. Right? We need to make sure that before we go to the next mini batch, all of the three model copies have the exact same weights to start with. But of course, they have learned different things because they have looked at different examples of the mini batch. So now we need to synchronize these models. In brackets, we need to just sum them up. <laughs> Either we sum the weights, although we, we agree on the weights, or we agree on the difference applied to the weights, which are the gradients. Typically, we agree on the difference applied to the weights, which are the gradients. And this is what a stochastic parallel stochastic gradient descent typically does. But now it turns out that these gradients, they can be sparsified quite a lot. So in fact, in practice, we can drop or we can choose to not communicate 90 to 99.9% .9 of the gradient values um, and achieve still similar accuracy. So how does it work? Well, before sending the vector, this is a very large weight vector. If I have 175 billion weights, my vector will have 175 billion gradient difference entries. What could I now do is I could now say, well, let me only maintain the 17 billion largest entries of this vector and remember the other ones in a local array that I'm sending later like when, when I'm summing them up. So I'm, every single time I compute my gradients locally, I sum them into a local array. But what I'm sending for synchronization to the other nodes is only the top k entries, let's say the top 10%. And if I'm doing this, I will actually achieve similar training accuracy, but of course at much reduced um, um, uh, much reduced communication costs because I'm only communicating 10% of the values. So we could now show this formally that this in fact also converges. But here I would uh, recommend, <laughs> again, in, in the context of this uh, keynote talk, I just want to mention that these techniques exist. And if you really care about details, uh, please look at the archive link or at the uh, NeurIPS 2018 publication that we, where you can read how to prove all the details. You could also see empirical estimations of um, these, these values here like this eta, 
that it actually holds in practice. And you can see fully trained um, results where you see, for example, with ResNet 110, that the difference between the baseline in red here and the various K for K equals 0.025% up to 0.2% is negligible. So the error at the end is about the same, the same for linear regression or this RCD1 uh, convergence. So you can throw away, uh, not really throw away, but omit the communication of many of the values and sum them locally for later communication. Right? That's a, a standard technique. Um, but now comes the, the question, how do we implement this efficiently? So we implemented a framework called SparseML which really implements these sparse reductions for these decentral updates. Again, you can look at the paper in detail at the archive link. Because the gradients, the sparse gradients, are going to look very different on each of the processes. Here in this case, I'm showing four processes in four different colors from left to right. And then I'm showing the all reduce algorithm going from top to bottom. First, two neighbors sum up their values, and then two neighbors with a skip neighbor of one sum up their values, and for a, a number of processes of four, this um, overall computation will have computed the all reduce, like the sum of all the values, as you can see, um, uh, successfully. But now the gradients, the top k gradients, are going to look different for each of the nodes. So here is the gradients for node 1. The, the uh, block itself is the, um, the overall vector. Everything that is white is 0, so these are values that are not sent, and everything that is black are non-zeros, these are the top k values that are sent. Now the gradient on, on, on node 2 looks different from the gradient on node 3, from the gradient on node 4. So now they have different non-zero patterns. What now happens if I'm summing up um, two sparse vectors, I will of course fill in um, lots of values, so they will get more dense in both of the cases, but then again I need to sum up these two vectors and will again, again get to a denser vector at the end, so I'm going from very sparse to very dense. And now you could think about, well, that is, that is interesting. So that saves communication, of course, but it is filling in the vector as we go. Um, there, this is an, an interesting observation, but still we are able to improve the, um, the convergence of, of real life models uh, quite substantially. So here in this case, we, uh, we are looking at a Microsoft speech production workload where we were actually able to go from two weeks to two days on a, on a relatively powerful compute cluster using these techniques, like using uh, sparse accumulations. Um, and then you can also see various uh, systems that we are looking at, um, it's like the Pitt-Stein system, which is a supercomputer, or the Amazon EC2 system for various data sets. And the speed up is impressive, especially for the Amazon EC2 system, because there the network is significantly slower than the supercomputer network. But even on the super fast supercomputer network, we are still achieving speed ups up to uh, 3.65x. Right? So, so sparsification is valuable. Actually, after this work, there is a, 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 more, um, uh, a more optimal, or a better implementation of this that uh, my postdoc Shi Gang Li developed that was published at PPOP uh, 2022. In case you're interested in this, I would uh, re highly recommend looking at this. This is called the OK Top K method, which improves this slightly further by employing better communication schedules. But this is easier to explain. This is why I chose uh, to explain it here in this keynote. OK, so now there is another aspect we could look at, at um, in, in deep learning, in par parallel deep learning, because some trainings uh, um, or some training scenarios cause very different work across different examples. So for example, if I'm training on videos of different lengths, and here is a particular data set, the UCF 101 data set from YouTube, um, we can see that the processing time of every, uh, sorry, this is the number of frames. <laughs> so that the number of frames for every example is actually wildly varying, right? So it ranges from only 29 frames up to 1,776 frames. The mean is 187 and the standard deviation is 97. So now if you look at the processing time of an LSTM, um, long short-term memory, the standard uh, deep neural network today, we see a wide variation going from close to zero milliseconds up to 3.5 seconds. Right? So, so this is a wide variation. And if you now look at the, the time a synchronous SGD would be spending here, um, there's the compute time, which is now widely varying. Right, so each of the nodes, these, these are compute nodes from top to bottom. So here we see six different uh, accelerators processing. But now each of these accelerators will finish at a different time depending on the, um, on the time the examples take that it got. 
then it'll wait in the synchronization phase to perform the all reduce because all accelerators need to be there to perform the global sum. And then it'll continue again with irregular unbalanced computation. It'll wait, it'll perform another synchronization, it'll continue, um, it, it'll, it'll perform another computation here in green, and then it'll wait again here in blue and perform another synchronization in red. You can see that this is quite inefficient. Right? These, many of these accelerators are waiting um, nearly 50% of their time if you actually sum it up. What we now developed is a new scheme that we call eager SGD, so it's not synchronous. We're basically sending the values as soon as they get ready in some sense. So here we do the computation, but then some values are already ready, as you can see in, the, in this case, like this accelerator is ready and this accelerator is ready, while this guy is still computing. But we already start summing the values, which we call a solo all reduce, and then they can immediately move on, right? You see here, this accelerator, after the computation, immediately moves on to the new example. Here, this one is kind of missing the communication phase, but moves into the next communication phase. But this is okay. Um, so some accelerators will not be ready when the computation start, uh, the communication starts, the computation of the global sum, and some will be ready. So this is what we call a solo all reduce, and we continue this, and you can see there is basically no waiting in this, uh, in this schedule. But of course, we are now communicating values that may not be fully synchronous. Hey, but isn't that the same as we looked at in the previous slide, where we, or in, in the previous example, where we were dropping 90% of the gradient values. Here, we are just ignoring some of the input, which will appear in the next iteration. Because of course, when the accelerator is too late for the communication, it will not discard the value. It'll just sum it up locally and contribute it to the next iteration. So you could implement this on smart NICs, for example, um, the, the SPIN project, Streaming Processing in the Network, also a project in my lab um, that could be used to implement uh, this fully asynchronous uh, synchronization or, or a summation. So now we could look at some results. So now if you look at uh, real results training the LSTM on the UCF 101 data set, um, we see this is the test accuracy in the, uh, in the, in the y-axis and on the x-axis we have the training time and we can see that for the synchronous SGD, um, it takes quite a while, the yellow line here, it takes quite a while to get to the uh, example, uh, to, to get to the speed. And for the eager SGD, um, or to get to the accuracy, eager SGD, it's, it's significantly faster. Uh, just to summarize this, I mean, you can look at this diagram um, longer, but what I would like to summarize is if you're willing to reduce the top one accuracy down a little bit, then you can get a significant speed up of nearly 60% of the calculation. But if you're using another scheme where we, we basically say, well, we are waiting until most of the gradients are ready. So this one, here I'm communicating the gradients what's the first is ready. Right? So of course we are losing more gradients because not everybody's ready. The majority triggers basically means we are computing the gradients once the majority is ready. Um, and then we can even maintain the, um, the top one accuracy pretty much to the original value, right? So keep that in mind, and you can see it here also in the left diagram, it's just interpretation, but we have less speed up. We have only 30% uh, speed up. Okay, this now depends on what you want. There's actually a next step that you can do, like this eager SGD is triggering early, okay? But there is now a next idea um, that you could apply. Well, why don't we sum, why don't we implement the partial sum? So for example, we do the same scheme again, but then we only uh, sum over every other node here. So we can see node one, node three, and node five. And the other nodes, they don't do anything um, to reduce communication. And then in the next iteration, we have the other nodes, two, four, and six, um, do the, the reduction and so on. And then at some point, every n iterations, where n is, is typically in the tens or hundreds, we do a full synchronous, synchronous model update to not allow the model to run out of sync too much. Okay, so you can do that scheme as well. For deep reinforcement learning, in fact, that works really well. And you can see here again in this diagram that we achieve a, a very high speed up. And again, um, this on the x-axis, <laughs> on the x-axis we have the training uh, time in hours, and we have the score on the y-axis, and the WAGMA SGD, which is the scheme I just talked about, fares best on basically on top, gets the highest score in a given training time budget while local SGD, for example, is relatively slow and standard SGD goes, um, goes uh, well, <laughs> slightly worse than Wagma SGD. Okay, so now I have basically talked about three different aspects, systems aspects of very large scale uh, super learning. 
I've talked about high performance I.O. using clairvoyant prefetching. I've talked about high performance compute using, um, using data movement is all you need. Um, and I talked about high performance communication, which is um, um, also quite challenging. In, in fact, this is the most challenging part here. Um, uh, Xi Gang Li's paper Chimera is also to be noted, which is a different pipelining scheme. And this pipelining scheme is, is so great that it was actually a best paper nominee at the supercomputing conference uh, last year. And the idea here was that we could actually run the pipeline, the pipeline parallelism at the same time forward as well as backward so that we get a higher pipeline utilization. But unfortunately, I don't have enough time in this uh, little keynote uh, to, to give you the, all the details, but I highly encourage you to check the papers. There are lots of these talks. I've given you an overview of these um, various schemes here. Lots of the talks are on our YouTube channel at, at my lab, and you can watch them in full length um, instead of me just giving them an overview at your leisure. Okay, so with that, I would actually go to the second part of the talk. Now, how do we train models that are larger than the largest computer can actually hold? Or, in other words, because the title of the talk was Efficient AI from Supercomputers to Cell Phones, how can we compress the models so much that they can run on my cell phone? Right? Because at the end, we ideally want to run <coughs> on cell phones. So now let me elaborate a little bit on compressing and optimizing these models. So we have trained gigantic models on a very large supercomputer, but now we want to compress them down to small models. One way is we could just use smaller models. For example, through distillation or neural architecture search, well, but that is hard, um, so I don't want to spend too much time there. We could use operator factorization. So we could use, we could represent matrices, like matrix multiplications, as factored decompositions, as you see here in this, this little e equation. That'll give you a low frequency uh, pass, basically, on the data and, and maintain much of the features, but it may lose the high frequency components, so it's, it's to some extent very useful. Then we could use value quantization. So we can represent our values, our floating point values, typically, as with smaller number of bits. This is a very popular technique. Most people do this today in deep neural networks. You train in FP32, sometimes you also train in FP16, but then when you put the models in inference, you either quantize them down to even integers, like 8-bit integers, 16-bit integers. We even have a model that we call GPTQ that down, uh, quantizes weights down to four or even two bits, right? So, so look for our publication uh, together with uh, Dan Alistar, actually led by Dan Alistar um, at, at IST, um, how to quantize GPTQ models. Um, this, you can do this with weights and activations and just represent each of the numbers with less bits, okay? I'm not going to talk about this uh, today. Um, then we can compre compress the values themselves. And of course, it's quite a simple scheme. You can just compress the model like with the, with the model like gzip, but that's uh, of limited use, I would say. And then there's a really new technique, a nice technique, where we can reuse parameters across neurons, um, parameter sharing. So um, we, we have done some work there on the shapeshifter networks or CNNs, our parameter shared networks at the end. Um, but shapeshifter networks generalize this to arbitrary networks, for example, also parameter sharing in uh, transformers. Or we could also call this um, um, parameter search uh, for, for neural architectures. Um, and then what I want to spend on the remaining 10 minutes is sparsification. So how do we take the models and actually remove values and um, compress them this way? So model sparsification is a fascinating topic because our brains, if we are going brain inspired, um, our brains are not densely connected. So why is our computation of deep neural networks today absolutely fully dense in most of the cases. Well, it is for technical reasons, I would, I would say, because the training has to work and the implementation has to work well and dense is much easier to implement than sparse. And also I will elaborate a little bit more why training dynamics recommend probably sparse models because of the SGD dynamics. So, but what the community is currently doing is we're going towards sparser models. So here we look at a dense model and the intuition is that not all features are always relevant. So what we can do is we can actually remove parts of the features, as you see with the sentence over there. You can read the bold sentence as a human, even though 30% of the letters are missing, but you will understand what it means. So the same in the deep neural network, we can just remove a large fraction of the neurons as well as the weights, and um, 
and still the neural, deep neural network will actually get a good prediction, like our brain is a, is a sparse entity. The key results here is that we can go 95% sparse, so we can remove 95% of the parameters in some ResNets, BERTs, and GPT models, and essentially have the same quality and can make them up to 20 times cheaper. So here I want to give you, and, and fit on your cell phone, right? Here I want to give you a little bit of an overview of, uh, of, of this very comprehensive paper uh, that I and my co-authors have written, more than 90 pages that have appeared um, in, in a top class machine learning uh, journal last year, but I can give you the 10 minute overview of the 90 pages now. So, so this will be a, a whirlwind ride. But what is the fundamental observation? The fundamental observation is that today's networks are over parameters. By the way, and again, you find this paper on archive as well, as well as the Journal of Machine Learning Research, uh, which is an open access journal online. Um, but today's networks are over parameterized, and you see it in the fact that they memoize full examples and they learn random labels even. <laughs> so do you really need to learn random label permutations for generalization? Probably not. Um, for some networks, you can show that 5% of the parameters is actually sufficient to predict the remaining 95% of the parameters. So there's some kind of recursive compression you could do. And there's also OCAM's razor and the minimum description length principle. In fact, it says that lower complexity models, so sparse models, for example, could lead to better generalization. And in some sense, dropout, as, which caused a huge revolution in, in the early 2000s, making models better in terms of generalization, is a form of sparsity. And I will mention that in the context of other sparsity forms later. Yet, we do have to train over-parameterized today because stochastic gradient descent as the method of choice is actually working pretty well. And I want to give you a, a quick intuition why I believe stochastic gradient descent works well in higher dimensional models. So here we have a loss function, a model with a loss on the L, uh, on the y-axis, and the, the single parameter x1 that we want to optimize on the x-axis. And you see the loss landscape here is just plotted fully. If we start at a random position S1, we go into a local minima there. If we start at a random position S2, we actually go into global minima. Right? So now the random starting position matters. If we now do this, if we extend the model by a second dimension X2, it's just a random dimension essentially. So here you can see it's just kind of a random landscape. It maintains along the X1 axis the exact same um, uh, landscape. So blue is high, yellow is low, and it's now of course a... Uh, um, a, a gradient view, um, two-dimensional gradient view. If we now start at S1, S1 has the chance to go to the global minimum if it navigates in the X2 dimension, which is kind of random. And if it now started S2, it can also still go to the global minimum. While in the upper case here, it's not possible, right, for any, um, for most optimization algorithms, let's say, um, that, that, are, that are monotonic. Um, but here, I can actually circumvent on the X2 axis. I can navigate across um, my complicated landscape. So if I'm just adding random dimensions to my deep learning model, the search, the SGD search for the optimum will likely benefit from it. Right? That just as a high level intuition. But now back to the data science of things. So what can we sparsify in the model? I already mentioned that we can sparsify the model itself. So we can remove weights, we can remove neurons, we can remove neuron-like structures like full filters, channels, or heads in transformers. We can also remove weights in an unstructured way or in a structured way. We can remove blocks of weights, so columns of the matrix, for example. And then we have structured sparsity and unstructured sparsity, which in that case affects both inference as well as the forward pass of training. Right? So we can use these, this to optimize everything. But then we have ephemeral sparsity, which is independent of the model, but here we go per example. So we sparsify activations and other ephemeral uh, ephemeral data. For example, dropout, as I mentioned before, drops activations or sometimes also weights um, in, in an ephemeral way. Activation computation itself, like ReLU, is a sparsifying, uh, is a sparsifier because ReLU cuts everything to zero that is negative, so the output will be sparse. You could sparsify gradients, you can sparsify errors, you can sparsify the optimizer state of your models. So for gradient-based optimization, of course. Conditional computation, like mixture of experts, which is a, a topic that is greatly uh, accelerating these days, is a form of ephemeral sparsity. You're now routing your signal only through a subset of your model, not the whole model. Dropout affects training, and the top, the top row affects training, and the activation sparsity and conditional computation affects the inference as well as the forward pass. So it's now a quite complex 
scenery of sparsity. Like, where can we apply it? What can we do? And again, this is the this quick summary of the 90 minute, uh, 90 page paper here <laughs> in, in, in nine minutes, essentially. Um, so now there is another dimension to it. How do we sparsify? Well, we could train and sparsify where we have the, the time axis on, on the bottom and the number of weights on the left side. So we train fully dense here in green and then we sparsify down to the yellow part. We can also sparsify during training, slowly move down, or we could sparsify full, we could train fully sparse, like where we need to do regrowth. All of these methods fit a general schedule where we initialize the structure, we initialize the weights, we initialize training, we prune and regrow, and then we retrain, and then we of course iterate on some of these uh, schemes. So this is a relatively simple uh, sparsification schedule. So now I actually want to uh, go rather quickly across this because I'm slowly running out of time here. Um, but the fundamental insight, actually, if you look at the dynamics, is this early structure adaptation. The fundamental insight is that as you train at the very beginning, your structure changes a lot. So like the non-zero structure will change significantly. But as you go towards the end of your training, as you can see here in, in the top, there's a massive decrease in the loss at the beginning. And then you only fine tune essentially towards the end. It's the same for sparsification. You have usually a massive change in the non-zero pattern at the beginning and then only later um, it, it consolidates. Okay, that's insight number one. Now, how can we actually sparsify? I didn't really say this yet. I told you what to sparsify and how it kind of behaves. But of course, how to sparsify is at least as complicated. So we could now um, train n to the k models to convergence by leaving k out. But that's, that's crazy. That's exponential and each model is very expensive. But then we can use various techniques to train a uh, sparsify without data, right? So we, we could uh, have remove similar neurons and weights. We could remove similar weights by magnitude. We could remove trivial elements in a data-driven way. So we run data through, we check whether some uh, elements do something to this data distribution or not. We could do this by sensitivity. We could also do this by correlation and similarity merge. These are all complex schemes that I don't have time to cover. We can do this in the training, we can actually amend the, the loss function, which is very uh, often done in, in practical data science, like have a sparsifying penalty, like an L1 penalty, for example, like a regularization. Ideally, you want L0, but typically you do L1, or you could use statistical variational techniques. Again, if you want to know all the details, I would recommend to look at the paper. So just to give you one example, one simple example at the very end of this talk, um, magnitude-based pruning. We could take, th these are the parameter values and the count. So there's a histogram of the parameter values. So it's centered around zero. So most of the parameter values are close to zero. What you do is you remove 70% of those values, right? So you remove all the values around zero, and then your accuracy goes from 76% target accuracy to 36%. Um, after three epochs retraining, we are actually back to 71%. This is quite interesting. You could use now the Taylor expansion of the loss function, which I don't have time to cover, to actually correct for this, for this error you're making. Right? And magnitude pruning is just a special case of a zeroth order expansion of the, the loss function. And again, I have to refer you for the, for the lack of time, I have to refer you to the, um, to, to the overview in the paper. But what you will learn is that actually global magnitude pruning is a good idea. Like the simplest scheme is a good idea if you have enough compute time. So that is quite nice. And I would like to, to skip this slide here and really get to the, the last point in best practices for sparsification. So if you really want to run large models on smaller computers going down to the cell phone, I would recommend the following best practices. So first of all, you need to pick the right pruning strategy. So you need to pick the right strategy how to remove these weights. Try regularization and magnitude pruning with iterative retraining. It's usually a good idea. Furthermore, retraining and fine tuning is absolutely necessary to find um, final qual good quality for the inference case. Second, you need to think whether you want to do structured pruning or unstructured pruning. Structured pruning typically enables higher performance on most compute devices, but also it has this inductive bias feature, unfortunately, that uh, you, you, or, or fortunately sometimes, that you could use for better accuracy or data efficiency. So this is a bit more complicated, but you need to consider it. Furthermore, you need to worry about the distribution of sparsity. Not every operator sparsifies equally well. So some layers are really hard to sparsify, like typically layer norm and the input and output layers are hard. Some are easy. And then, of course, you need to combine ephemeral as well as model sparsity 
for better performance. So do you want to only sparsify the weights or the activations? And can your compute device take advantage of weight and activation sparsity at the same time or not? So these are five rough guidelines extracted from this 90 page uh, paper that I summarized in nine minutes. And I apologize if it was a little bit too fast. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk and um, I'm open for questions and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.